So there we go. There, good, we're recording. All right. So Tuliomi, we're a nonprofit organization based in Woodland, Yolo County, California. And I encourage all of you to visit our website to find out more about us. Uh, it's tuliomi.org and um, it's on every one of the emails that you've got to, to register for this talk. Our mission in a nutshell is to encourage people to appreciate, visit, enjoy, and conserve the inner coast range mountains of California. So those are the mountains on the west side of the Sacramento Valley, just north of the Davis Woodland area. And it's the home to the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument. Uh, thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, and please come again next month on March 25th, we have Dr. Lars Anderson. He'll be speaking about the, the Woodland Regional Park, which is a new area, 165 acres outside of Woodland. And it's a, a reclaimed landfill that's turning into a nature park. Um, tonight's speaker is Dr. Tom Batter, a wild life biologist and with UC Davis and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. First, a couple of things about Zoom. I think at this point in the pandemic, everybody's pretty comfortable with Zoom, but just in case, um, I'm going to ask you guys keep, to keep your audio off and video off too if possible, but if not, it's no big deal. But try to keep your audio off. And to ask questions, use the chat feature. So that's at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And um, you can type in your questions as, as the talk is going on, and then we'll address the questions at the end. I'll be monitoring the, the, the chat as well. So if there's like some question you have for me, I can, I can monitor it. But the questions for uh, Dr. Batter will be going at the, will be addressed at the end of the talk. So at this point, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tom Batter. Welcome. All right. Uh, thanks, Bill. I uh, appreciate it. Appreciate you for uh, inviting me to speak tonight. Um, so my name is Tom Batter. Uh, I just I recently finished up my PhD at, at UC Davis, uh, studying Tule Elk uh, in the Mammalian Ecology and Conservation Unit. Uh, it was under the, the guidance of Dr. Ben Sachs, uh, the director of, of the MECU. Um, so I've been with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, in some capacity since uh, 2012. Um, and I'm, I'm, since I uh, finished my PhD, I'm, I'm now a unit wildlife biologist down in, in Region 6 uh, that's in Southern California, uh, covering San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Um, so I kind of traded in tule elk for, for desert sheep and, and mule deer. So, um, but it's, it's, I'm excited to talk with with you tonight about my research. Um, tule elk are near and dear to my heart. So uh, I'll kind of kick off here, try to share my screen. We got the first, the title slide up there, Bill. Are we good? Yes. Yeah, it looks okay. good. Okay, great. So <clears throat> uh, like I said, I'll be talking about uh, California's tule elk tonight. Um, <clears throat> See if I can get this thing going. So just kind of introduction overview. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, give a broad overview of tule elk in general. So a, a lot of information that uh, I'm excited to share. I'll we'll start off with tule elk life history, uh, and then I'll, I'll move into natural history. And then we'll talk about uh, modern management of tule elk, where I'll uh, discuss some of my, some of my research. Uh, so we'll just kind of start off with elk 101, uh, introduction to some of the basics of elk. <clears throat> so North American elk, they're among the largest deer in the world uh, and not to be confused with European red deer, which is a, a separate species. So we'll sometimes uh, see North American elk referred to uh, as wapiti in both formal or informal literature. And this is a Shawnee word <clears throat> meaning white rump and that's in reference to that, the notable rump patch uh, worn by elk. Uh, so taxonomically, 
they're categorized within the order Artiodactyla. So these are even-toed ungulates or hoofed mammals uh, that are defined by the structure of their foot where they bear weight equally on two toes. So that's that, that cloven hoof, if you're uh, familiar. <clears throat> uh, so they're placed in the, the order, the suborder Ruminantia. Uh, so these are ruminants, which are herbivores. And they digest plant material uh, through a specialized four-chambered stomach. And so they ingest and, and regurgitate plant material. And this is called the cud. And so they chew the cud to help break down that plant material for further digestion. Uh, so finally, they're classified in the family Cervidae. This is the deer family. And elk have typical characteristics of the deer family that include uh, long, powerful legs, a reduced tail, and they exhibit sexual dimorphism where males are larger than females and males also possess antlers. Uh, so some terminology specific to elk, males are bulls, uh, females are cows, and offspring are, are called calves or yearlings. <clears throat> uh, so California, it's the only state or province in North America with more than two subspecies of elk. So we've got Rocky Mountain elk, Roosevelt elk, and Tule elk. And the basic differences uh, between the three are body size, antler size, coat color and then uh, the habitat that they're adapted to. And so, uh, like I've said a number of times, we're gonna specifically focus on, on tule elk tonight. <clears throat> so tule elk are endemic to California. Uh, they're found nowhere else in the world and they're the most specialized form of elk. So they're the only subspecies that's adapted to dry environmental conditions and open habitat. And, and their adaptations include a uh, lighter coat color to help keep them cool in the, in the sun uh, they also have these subtle dental modifications to handle uh, the grinding of a diet high in fibrous grasses. Uh, they're non-migratory and relative to other subspecies, they have uh, smaller body size uh, where males are about five to 700 pounds uh, and, and females about three to 400 pounds uh, when fully grown. And so this smaller size uh, historically earned them the name of dwarf elk and they're also sometimes uh, called California Valley elk. And so in the 19th century, uh, tule elk experienced a rapid decline and they were even presumed extinct at one point, but they have since uh, recovered through intense management. And today tule elk exists in this sort of uh, fragmented meta population or a, a network of populations uh, that are irregularly connected across the landscape. And so they, they're, they're numbered uh, just under 6,000 animals today across uh, 22 recognized populations, including uh, three confined populations within, within high fence indicated on the map here. <clears throat> uh, so before we dive into circumstances that led us to the present situation, uh, we first need to understand tule elk's life history traits. Uh, so tule elk, they're social animals. They live in groups called herds. Uh, they engage in a polygynous mating system where males breed with multiple females. Uh, and you get a, a dominant herd bull that defends and controls a cow group. Uh, and this is called a, a harem. Uh, so the breeding season is called the rut. Uh, males bugle to challenge and intimidate rival bulls. And this bugle is a, is a high-pitched, uh, unique sound in the animal kingdom uh, where air is simultaneously uh, forced out of both the mouth and nostril. And it's really this, this iconic sound of the Western frontier. <clears throat> so outside of the mating season or outside of the rut, uh, elk will sexually segregate across the landscape uh, where males and females, they, they separate and form their own, their own groups. And then uh, bulls drop antlers after the mating season. Uh, and then they spend time acquiring nutrients to grow uh, the next set of antlers. So if you're familiar with antlers, uh, you know that they can be pretty impressive and they're also biologically uh, very interesting. So fully grown antlers are, are very dense mineralized bone uh, and, and it's an organ that's unique to cervids. So it's, it's a deciduous organ, meaning that they're cast and regenerated annually uh, and they're very fast growing up to one inch per day. And this is among the fastest rates of tissue growth in the entire animal kingdom uh, and it's the only example of regeneration of an appendage among mammals. So this growth period, uh, you have vascularized bone tissue that's covered in skin and fine soft hairs. And this is referred to as being in velvet. And once uh, the antlers are fully formed, they shed this velvet 
Uh, they can shed up to 10 pounds of velvet annually. Uh, and they shed it by rubbing or scraping their antlers against uh, basically anything they can find, trees, shrubs, brush, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, so antlers, when we talk about antlers, they're, they're a function of a combination of things, specifically uh, nutrition, genetics, and age. And they're, what are, what they're referred to uh, what we call honest indicators. Uh, these are honest signals of metabolic efficiency and access uh, to quality nutrition. So basically the larger the antlers, uh, we can assume the more fit that individual likely is, presumably more dominant, uh, higher up in social rank, and it's likely able to gain access to the best feed. And it's more desirable for a cow to mate with, less desirable for a rival bull to challenge. <clears throat> and so this, this illustration in the bottom right here uh, shows antlers of the three subspecies in California kind of give you some context in terms of size. Uh, so from left to right is the Thule, uh, then Rocky Mountain in the middle and Roosevelt Elk on the right. And uh, you'll notice there's obvious uh, size differences and then there's uh, some slight structural differences as well. And uh, believe it or not, antlers do have parts to them. Uh, the base of the antler is the burr and this is where growth begins or sprouts out of the pedicle, which is uh, the pedicle is an extension of the the frontal bone of the skull. So you get one main beam uh, and then multiple structures branching off the main beam and these are called tines. So you have the brow, bay, tray, royal and sir royal tines and the last two together are, are called uh, the crown of the antler. Uh, so here we have some photos to help visualize that regeneration process. So the new growth, you can see the cast scar on top of the new growth there. You get these kind of onion bud looking deals coming out of, of uh, the pedicle uh, and they enter velvet where antlers during the stage are, are pretty sensitive and can be fairly easily damaged uh, during this highly vascularized stage. So they tend to use uh, more open areas while they're in velvet until the antlers uh, reach full size, uh, antlers become ossified, and then uh, here, like in this individual, they begin to shed the velvet. Um, and here we have some examples of some uh, different age classes uh, from uh, kind of clockwise from top to bottom. Uh, we've got a spike bull upper left and then uh, juvenile bulls top right that are, you'll sometimes hear them referred to as, as raghorns. Uh, and then in the bottom, uh, a couple examples of some mature bulls. And then uh, disintegration occurs uh, at the pedicle. Once testosterone levels decrease and the antler is cast, the pedicle begins to heal and uh, the process of regeneration begins again. Uh, so in terms of diet, uh, tule elk are called, are referred to as intermediate feeders. They're adapted for either uh, grazing or browsing. Uh, they're able to shift their feeding behavior uh, according to plant availability and environmental conditions. So, in good conditions, they tend to mainly graze, consume grasses and forbs. Uh, and I, I mentioned earlier, they have subtle dental modifications. Um, and these modifications include a, a longer tooth row, uh, more exaggerated selenodont or crescent shaped cheek teeth. And they have this more complex folding enamel uh, relative to other elk that's, that's more suited for a diet high in rough fibrous plants. So as conditions become less favorable, uh, tule elk will turn to browse, um, but obviously specific preferences uh, vary by region and, and time of year. Uh, but, but some of the principal forage plants uh, for tule elk include uh, the California oat grass, um, sinophis or, or buckbrush, uh, blue oak, or they'll, they'll eat the, the leaves and the, the acorn crop from oaks, and then also uh, wet meadow and marsh plants like sedges and, and bulrushes. Uh, so with, with all those characteristics in mind, uh, we can take a look at the, the annual life cycle of tule elk. So spring to summer uh, is the calving season. Calves are generally dropped between uh, about April and May after an eight and a half month gestation period or, or pregnancy. Uh, newborn calves uh, are spotted at birth and they, they typically weigh around 30 pounds or so. Uh, and during this time, bulls are hanging out in bachelor groups and, and cow-calf groups uh, on the landscape. And the spring goes on, but bulls begin to uh, regenerate their antlers and they're observed in velvet. Uh, and then we enter the summer into the fall, 
where antlers are, are hardened and they're out of velvet by July or August. And then the, the pre-rut begins in the summer um, and bulls start to bugle across the landscape and, and group sizes start to increase as animals begin to congregate uh, to, to mate in the fall and bulls start to gather harems and challenge for and defend cow groups. Uh, and the herd bull will uh, tend, to, tend to the harem by preventing uh, the cows from traveling or wandering too far off uh, they have this elaborate display of antlers and then uh, they'll defend the harem from, from other challenging bulls. And this goes on until about October or November. Uh, and, and we move into the, the winter months or the post rut. Uh, bulls retreat to seclusion or small bachelor groups and cows remain in relatively large bands. Um, at this time, the, the bulls are trying to recover from the rut. It's a very costly uh, time of year for them. They can go through the rut, um, surviving up to 70 days on body fat alone. Uh, and this, they end up losing about 20% of their body weight because, because they're focused on, on one thing and that's not, that's not eating. Uh, they can also sustain about 40 to 60 antler wounds from engaging in sparring matches with, with other bulls. And so they're, it just gives you an idea, they're basically limited to the finish line. And so they, they seek seclusion or form small bachelor groups and, uh, more isolated patches of habitat, generally near water to recuperate. And uh, we start to see testosterone levels decrease, uh, antlers are cast or dropped in February or March, and then that cycle uh, begins again. <clears throat> and so this cycle uh, played out over much of California for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, in what we'll call pristine conditions, tule elk occupied well over a quarter of California. Uh, they are primarily concentrated in the, the marshes and open plains of the interior Central Valley here, but they're also were uh, sort of irregularly found in the coast and interior coast uh, hill country. And so during uh, pre-European pre -European settlement, the sort of fashionable number thrown around is about half a million to yuck existed on the landscape. And these are really uh, crude estimates derived from journals and records kept by early explorers and settlers. Uh, so we don't really know exactly how many there were, but we get a good idea. I mean, the point is there were a lot of tule elk populating quite a bit of California. Now, uh, their relationship with indigenous peoples, there, there's this idea that exists that Europeans arrived and found this vast uncharted wilderness to be tamed. And that really is not true at all. Uh, Native peoples across the Americas, including California, actually exerted vast control over the landscape and manipulated the landscape to their advantage. And one of the key tools that was used uh, was fire. Uh, fires were ignited to burn off dry vegetation and invigorate uh, new growth. And this was beneficial to wildlife, including elk. <clears throat> so indigenous peoples, they, they would occasionally harvest tule elk for subsistence and to manufacture uh, tools and clothing, but given tule elk's preference for more open habitat and across the plains and swamps, it was pretty difficult and energetically costly to harvest an elk. So we really saw more small mammals, birds, and, and deer supply more animal protein annually than elk did. And actually uh, the diet of most Aboriginal tribes in California was predominantly vegetable material, especially uh, from acorn crop. So the level of, of take by indigenous peoples had little to no impact on elk numbers uh, during the time of European arrival. Now, when, when we mention tule elk or just talk about them, almost everyone who's aware of their story has some familiarity with, with how it goes where they uh, declined, almost went extinct, and then they've rebounded. But what's somewhat obscured to history are, are really these underlying socioeconomic factors uh, that resulted in this great decline. <clears throat> uh, so Tuliok declined primarily due to uh, five primary factors. Uh, including fire suppression, introduction of non-native plants, competition with livestock, unregulated market hunting, and conversion of uh, prime habitat to cropland. Uh, and this occurred uh, over four general time periods, um, 
all of which are interrelated and somewhat overlapping. And, and the decline really started with the Spanish mission period uh, and the California fur brigades in the late 1700s into the early 1800s. Um, during this era, there's a high number of people moving into Spanish California, uh, one to spread Western culture and, and two to ex exploit these fur resources. Um, and all these uh, factors contributed to habitat degradation that really took its toll on, on tule elk numbers. So by 1840, uh, tule elk began to experience range decline. Uh, there's many tule elk that retreated and found refuge in the interior valley uh, tule marshes. Um, this gave rise to the, the current common name that we use. Um, and the decline began even more rapidly with the discovery of gold in 1848 and the onset of uh, the subsequent gold rush. Uh, so during the gold rush, we've got 300,000 plus settlers arriving in California and they're taking advantage of elk as a food resource in addition to all the other game that's available. Um, and many folks failed as gold miners, and so they end up turning to unregulated market hunting too. And they, you could fetch about 50 cents to a dollar for an elk hide at the time. That's about 37 or $38 uh, today. And so in response, uh, the California legislature closed elk hunting for six months in 12 counties in 1852. And then 1854, uh, the legislature extended this closure to the balance of the state. And that really wasn't enough to help stop the decline, uh, these laws were poorly enforced uh, if they were enforced at all. So uh, by 1860, as marshes and sloughs are drained for cropland, uh, tule elk are pushed to the southern portion of the Central Valley. <clears throat> and while market hunting definitely pushed them to the brink, uh, at this point, tule elk are essentially doomed by the fact that they occupy prime agricultural land. Uh, so by 1870, there's very few tule elk left within a very uh, restricted range. And they're actually presumed extinct by about 1871. So in, in true California legislative fashion, uh, in 1873, the government belatedly passed a law uh, declaring it a felony to harvest an elk. Um, but fortunately, some elk did remain. In 1875, uh, workers draining sloughs for cropland on the Miller and Lux Ranch uh, discovered a pair of elk taking refuge in the tule patches. Uh, so cattleman Henry Miller, uh, uh, the owner of this property, he owned quite a bit of property in California, about half a million acres over the state. Uh, and he was keen on seeing the tule elk recover. So he set aside 600 acres on this property to give the elk a chance to rebound. Uh, and he ordered his ranch hands to let the elk be. And this was, this was a critical move in the recovery of tule elk. So late 1800s, tule elk are now afforded some level of protection on private property and they began to multiply. Uh, they eventually reached such numbers that they started to cause uh, over $5,000 worth of damage annually. Um, Miller's wealth afforded him the ability to absorb such losses for some time, uh, but eventually he sought, he sought uh, state intervention because Miller felt that uh, a better solution was needed to ensure their survival uh, as as land started becoming more subdivided uh, to make way for these ranchos and, and rancherias and, and the state agreed. <clears throat> so in the start of the 20th century, we've, we've got this early era of translocations and the state attempted to reintroduce elk through various parts of California uh, 21 times during this period, uh, two of which ultimately became successful free ranging herds. Uh, the first um, established in 1922 at Cache Creek in Calusa County, it's the far north little brown polygon. Uh, the second in 1933 in uh, Owens Valley in Inyo County, it's that eastern polygon. It's out, you'll, you'll notice it's actually outside their historical range. Uh, and then finally that the remnant herd at the Miller Ranch um, became confined behind high fence and it's, it is uh, still present today. It's the Tupman State Tule Elk Reserve uh, near Button Willow. And that's that tiny polygon in the southern portion of, of the Central Valley there that you can, you can hardly see. Uh, so from the 1930s on, there's a pretty hands-off management approach um, where elk were just kind of left to, to proliferate and, and uh, grow their populations. But 
uh, by the 1970s, we have this renewed interest in tule elk. And um, in 1971, the state passed Senate Bill uh, 722. And two major things happen here when this bill is passed. Uh, first, this bill prohibited hunting of tule elk until the statewide population was greater than 2,000 animals. Uh, second, it required the state to move tule elk to reestablish populations within historic range. So two things that are affected uh, modern management. And, and so during the 1970s and 1980s, this translocation intensity increased and many new herds are established. And uh, the result is that the present fragment and distribution of tule elk today. And it, it really is a great conservation success story. We've got elk on the brink of extinction and they're down to only two or three animals. Um, and this is a, a fact confirmed by the way, uh, by two separate genetic analyses in, in 2007 and, and 2016, um, that it was very likely only two or three animals remaining of which the nearly 6,000 tule elk today are all descendants of. Um, but due to this rapid decline of the 1800s, tule elk experienced uh, what's called the genetic bottleneck. So this means they lost a significant amount of genetic variation, and we still see a limited genetic diversity within tule elk today. So through careful management, uh, we can attempt to retain what genetic diversity there is, and that's really a major component of modern tule elk management. Uh, so how do we manage these populations? Well, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife recently published uh, our elk management and conservation plan in December, 2018. And uh, the core document, it, it describes uh, a lot of what we just talked about, uh, historic uh, distribution of elk, different things affecting each subspecies and, and the management activities that are um, necessary to achieve goals and objectives. And chief among these activities is uh, population monitoring. And, uh, and by the way, this, this document is available online at the at CDFW's website if you follow um, to, the, to the conservation and uh, mammals and elk page. <clears throat> um, but in order to, to monitor elk, we need to collect uh, data. So the ultimate goal is conservation of California's elk populations. And we use science-based conservation and management uh, to guide actions and lend credibility to our decisions. And this includes incorporating an adaptive management approach where we include learning into the process uh, and alter our approach based off what we learned works or doesn't work. <clears throat> so here's just a, a, a kind of laundry list of the types of data that we collect to monitor populations. And um, because elk are distributed irregularly, irregularly in California, uh, the levels of, of human elk conflict uh, environmental impacts and interactions with other wildlife, for example, it's really variable throughout the state. So understanding population sizes and trends at the local scale is, is it's essential for effectively managing and conserving elk. And so these types of data serve to inform management decisions. And as you're no doubt aware, California is a large and diverse state. There's a, a wide range of habitat and terrain types. So we need to be able to use a wide variety of methods uh, to monitor populations. And um, in any population, we generally employ at least two or, or usually more monitoring techniques uh, based on, on many factors, including uh, visibility, feasibility, uh, safety, and costs, among others. Uh, so I spent the last five years or so uh, conducting research in, in Northern California's interior coast range. Uh, so this is our study area outlined uh, on the map here. Uh, and in this area, we've got four populations. Uh, I'll briefly introduce them along with their uh, estimated range boundaries. So <clears throat> the first one I mentioned earlier, the Cache Creek herd, was established in, in 1922, and it's the oldest free-ranging uh, tule elk herd in California. Uh, Next, we have the Lake Pillsbury population. This was established in 1978 uh, as part of that resurgent effort to reintroduce tule elk across California. And almost immediately upon their reintroduction, most of the elk left that area uh, in search of greener pastures. And they uh, naturally established a population in the Fertile Potter, the fertile Potter Valley. Uh, and then we've got um, 
the East Park Reservoir population uh, was established by 1992 as, as part of a, a byproduct of reintroductions in the late 1980s. Uh, the state released elk sort of in the center of Mendocino National Forest there, um, and they dispersed into, into small, uh, small bands throughout the forest, and most are thought to have perished because it was just not the greatest habitat. Um, but around 1990, some elk were observed near Stonyford, California, and by 1992, uh, this viable reproducing population uh, was established. So um, you'll see these estimated range boundaries come up quite a bit through the rest of the talk. Um, you'll also notice as we go on, I, I should just note now, the Potter Valley is uh, excluded from most of our study, and this is really just based on a technicality um, because it's found in Mendocino County. It's it's part of CDFW is region one, and most of our study area, well, all of our study area except that is in region two. So, um, but you'll you'll see this population come into play uh, later on. Uh, so we use several methods to collect uh, population data in Calusa and Lake Counties from 2017 to 2019, uh, including aerial surveys, uh, GPS collars, uh, trail cameras, and, and genetic tools. Uh, and each method that we use is essentially utilizes a, a solution of sorts to limitations of the other methods. So when, when these methods are combined, we're able to piece together the overall bigger picture and produce a better understanding uh, of our populations as a whole. Um, so start with aerial surveys. They're uh, uh, an efficient monitoring method. It can cover a lot of ground uh, over a small number of days. Um, either in, with fixed wing or, or helicopter. And, and we use these uh, surveys to count elk, uh, determine group composition, so numbers of bulls, cows, and calves. Uh, and then we can use these data to estimate population size. So um, if, you're, if you're still awake and following along, uh, this is your first challenge of the evening. Um, can see if you can if you can count the number of elk in this photo. This is a an image taken during helicopter surveys uh, by a colleague of mine, Drew Trosh. Um, so I'll give you a couple seconds to count. Uh, and you, I don't know. Enter your you can enter your guess in in the chat. We'll see if anybody gets it right. I don't have any prizes for anybody, but um, so this kind of gives you an idea of of. Uh, the point of view from the helicopter and, and you know, it really, it, it's pretty difficult to get uh, a good count on these animals. Um, let's see what some of the guesses are coming in. I see a lot of 38s and 39s. It is 39. So if you guessed 39, well, I guess not guess. If you got 39, <laughs> give yourself a pat on the back. Um, it is, there's 39 and there's, there's two bulls in there. And I, I think I counted seven calves. Um, so that means there's about 30 cows. There should be 30 cows. Uh, so here's your second challenge and your final challenge of the evening. If you get motion sickness, you might consider looking away. Um, so here's a, a video that I took, uh, during one of our aerial, aerial surveys. So try to count the elk now uh, when it's not a still photo. You can see it's very challenging. You've got uh, animals running around, moving over hillsides out of view, in and out of, in and out of shade. You got the, the rotor moving up top. Um, so it's tough to say, are you, are you double counting the same individuals? Uh, what about the group composition? Are you able to differentiate bulls from cows and, and from calves. Um, so you can see it, it, it's not an easy task. Um, conditions are highly variable across survey sites, impacting our ability to detect and reliably count elk. So uh, a lot of thought and planning needs to go into these surveys. Uh, and uh, biologist, regional biologist, uh, Josh Bush for Calusa Lake County uh, led our aerial survey effort. Um, in 2018 and 2019, we flew these predetermined transects uh, in a helicopter and sampled across uh, known and unknown uh, elk use areas, the purple and, and green polygons. Uh, so we use what's called distance sampling, where we um, estimate the distance of the elk group from the helicopter using a rangefinder, uh, And this allows us to use a formula uh, to figure out a probability of detection of elk 
And that tells us um, how many elk we likely missed while we were counting. And this is what allows us to produce a bounded estimate. Um, so in this case, we estimated about 671 elk across the entire study area um, averaged during 2018 and 2019. Uh, and so that was about 166 at Pillsbury, 109 at East Park and uh, 396 at Cache Creek. Um, and again, if for those interested, this, uh, this report's available online at the CDFW website. <clears throat> Uh, so these aerial surveys, they're, they're also beneficial in that uh, we get a brief snapshot of the elk on the landscape so we can get a sense of where they are and what kind of habitat they're using. Um, the problem is that this info, it's, it's limited to those few number of days that we actually fly. So uh, we turn to other methods to help us better understand species of elk. And that's with satellite GPS collars. And, and these these items, they've, they've really helped to change and improve wildlife management. And uh, while brands and e equipment vary, the principle is the same. We have a lightweight collar that attaches to this GPS equipment. Um, and then we then capture and, and uh, apply a collar to the animal. And while the animal's moving around, uh, the GPS logs a location point um, along a predetermined time interval. In our case, uh, we had them log every 13 hours. Uh, and then a point is delivered to a satellite in space and that satellite uh, redirects that data back down. And it's either stored on board the unit uh, or more preferably that data is stored uh, in the cloud somewhere and it's available online. Uh, <clears throat> so to, to fit elk with collars, we first need to capture them, like I mentioned, and we use a few methods to do so, uh, including ground darting where you can either use a ground blind or, or spot and stock. And, uh, you can imagine it's pretty inefficient waiting for animals to walk by. Um, we also have used corral trapping. We have a baited corral trap in the top right corner there. Uh, this takes a lot of time and preparation. You got to set up the trap. Uh, you have to habituate elk to get comfortable using the trap. Um, a lot of bait applied. And then you also deal with non-target animals coming in, um, usually uh, hogs coming in and eating all the bait and ruining everything. Um, but then we also use uh, aerial net gunning, and this is easily the most efficient. We can capture, you know, a dozen animals in a day. It's the fastest and, and safest method, really. Um, so here I've got a video uh, to, to demonstrate the, this net gunning technique. Um, you can see the helicopter, the pilot isolates a target animal <clears throat> uh, from the group and then fires the net gun, makes contact with the animal, uh, he then lowers and, and the crew jumps out uh, to get on that animal, uh, to get it comfortable and calm and provide um, uh, care for it while it's, in our, uh, while it's in our hands. And we apply the collar and then uh, safely release the animal and it's on its way to collect data for us. So once we get a collar on an animal, uh, we can remote log into the website uh, from any device and we can see the most recent points um, so for example, when we log in uh, on the bottom right, that's what the website looks like. You can download that file, um, project points into other programs like Google Earth or ArcGIS. And um, this is useful uh, in its own right to just passively monitor elk. So at this basic level, we can log in and just see where individuals currently are on the landscape. Um, we'll also get uh, mortality alerts if the collar stops moving after a certain time period, and then we can go in and in, uh, investigate specific cause of death, uh, helps us understand predation or, or disease, for example. Um, but the collar data, they're really useful in a, a variety of ways beyond that. And we may want to look at, uh, for example, how space use differs between bulls and cows and during biologically meaningful times of the year. Uh, so here we have GPS point densities of seven Lake Pillsbury bulls uh, during the, the, the three major portions of the annual life cycle I discussed earlier. Uh, so we see bulls are pretty diffuse over the landscape uh, during the pre-rut in that left panel there. Uh, this implies that there's, there's relatively high movement, resources are abundant during this time, and they're, they're busy moving around packing on uh, nutrients for antler growth and, and for the rut. Uh, in that center panel, uh, we see bulls start to concentrate into the Lake Pil Pillsbury Basin uh, during the rut where they're um, 
challenging for and, and, and competing for access to cows. <clears throat> and then in the, that right panel, we start to see the bulls spread out again into the post rut period, um, but they're not quite moving around as much. They're not, they're, they're concentrated in little patches. Um, resources are, are generally less abundant. They're recovering from, from the rut activities and, and not moving around as much. And this tracks with um, our expectations based off the life history traits we talked about. Uh, and so note the, the scale here as we move to the next slide, particularly the lake body, you've got Lake Pillsbury there. We're gonna zoom in real close to it when we look at females. Um, we got the same type of data from five Lake Pillsbury cows concentrated in that lake, in that lake basin. Um, there's really not a lot going on here. The, the lady elk are content to remain in that lake basin year round. And um, it's kind of a unique area. And, and this is one of the more um, extreme contrasts you'll, you'll see across bulls and cows. But uh, <clears throat> as, you, as you can see, collars, they're really instrumental tool uh, to help us understand space use patterns. Uh, and behavior, and they provide just a, a, a wide variety of benefits. So we have something like 80,000 GPS uh, points, probably more at this point from um, 78 elk across this area. Uh, and we can quantify home range sizes. Uh, we, can, we can look at uh, or identify critical areas such as calving grounds. Um, we can also use it to describe uh, environmental features that are important to tule elk. Uh, so things that, for example, um, there's this thing, things called uh, resource selection models. And one of my uh, colleagues at UC Berkeley, Dr. Thomas Connor, uh, is busy producing resource selection models uh, using collar data from this area. And so the results from that are gonna be uh, really exciting and really, really useful. Uh, in terms of collars, uh, on, on the other hand, you know, they, they can be fairly expensive uh, to capture animals and to maintain the equipment. Um, and really the main drawback of this method is that we have to physically handle the animals to attach these collars. And this, is, this really isn't ideal. If, if, the other, if other methods are available to get us the same types of data, uh, we prefer to use those. And um, wildlife professionals are, are continuously starting to turn uh, more and more to non-invasive methods. Uh, and one such non-invasive approach is using uh, trail cameras. Um, these are available, you know, in, in any sporting goods store, really, and it allows uh, passive data collection for different purposes. We, we can set these in the field and um, really only limited by, by battery life and memory capacity. Uh, adverse weather can also affect it. And um, of course, there's always the threat of, of theft, but uh, generally you'll, you'll set the camera on a tree or, or fence posts, or you can bring cheap posts out into the field or something. And so we've got our camera set, set there in the, that red circle. Uh, and it's triggered by uh, motion and thermal sensors once an animal passes in front of it, like this uh, young tule bull right here. Uh, so I'll just run through some examples of some trail camera pictures that we get and, it, and the kind of data we can get from it. It, it can help us get a, a crude estimate of spatial occupancy. Um, you know, do we detect elk or not? It, it helps us better understand uh, range boundaries. Um, site-specific habitat use. We can estimate uh, sex ratios, classified demographics, and document behavior uh, like these bulls sparring or like this calf uh, suckling at East Park. Um, and we can also detect how elk deal with extreme conditions, so response to wildfire events um, or how they handle these extreme 101 degree days. Um, I think that Cash Creek is uh, much more pleasant during the spring, and I think that the elk tend to agree by their uh, body language here. Um, but arguably, uh, some of the greatest advancements in technology uh, for wildlife research and management is happening uh, in the lab, uh, and that's with the use of genetic tools. So uh, genetics are really improving our understanding of some of the underlying processes of wildlife populations in general uh, and tule elk in particular. So we can use tissue, uh, blood or fecal samples to get DNA. And over the last decade or so, uh, fecal DNA projects are becoming more and more commonplace for a variety of species. Um, this method is, is really attractive because it's non-invasive um, where there's no animal handling involved, but 
uh, provides just a, a wealth of information. So we collect samples in the field, um, bringing them back to the lab and extract and analyze DNA uh, following laboratory, laboratory protocols. Um, and then the results from this extraction provides us with an animal's genotype. And, and we use this program bottom right here called Strand uh, to assign uh, allele scores according to those peaks that you see in the middle um, to get us our genotypes. And this can be thought of as their, uh, an individual's distinct genetic fingerprint, so to speak. And so we're able to identify distinct individuals and their sex and uh, these data we can then use to estimate total elk numbers. Uh, and management-wise, uh, application of this method in the field allows us to detect elk that maybe we wouldn't from uh, other methods like aerial surveys. For example, elk that we might not see that are in uh, forested areas during flight, uh, we can detect them by collecting uh, their fecal material on the landscape. And <clears throat> when we compare our data uh, across methods, can sort of get a sense of how they're working. Uh, we look at the two-year averages here of aerial estimates on the left uh, and our fecal estimates on the right. And our fecal estimates uh, compare pretty favorably to our aerial distance sampling. Um, what's particularly noticeable is our, our level of precision from fecal sampling. Uh, so the error bars, uh, they're, they're a bit narrower around the point estimate um, and uh, suggests our, our true population estimate lies somewhere within that range. And the fact that uh, our estimates are similar for each population across independent methods, it, it's a good sign. We can be fairly confident that our true popula population estimate lies within those uh, error bars. And um, so we can be pretty confident in our management decisions based off these data, uh, such as establishing sustainable harvest quota. Uh, but the, the DNA, uh, DNA method has an added benefit in that we can, um, we can extend that genetic data uh, to better understand population and subpopulation level interactions, uh, for example, by investigating population structure. So uh, population structure is simply uh, the presence of subgroups with ancestry differences within a population. So uh, when subgroups or subpopulations are isolated from one another, uh, they begin to genetically differentiate due to random chance or what's called genetic drift. And genetic drift can have negative consequences uh, for populations, including loss of fitness uh, and potentially local extinction. And this effect is amplified in small populations such as these elk herds that are under study. Now, in reality, uh, virtually every wildlife population is subdivided uh, to some degree. So the question really at hand is how subdivided are we talking and, and what are uh, its management implications? <clears throat> so we know that our populations are spatially separated um, across the landscape. Not, so our, our past and current caller data in this region uh, has yet to reveal movement of individuals between herds. Um, so this means that such an activity is either rare or non-existent in our study system. And so we're likely uh, somewhere on this side of that connectivity spectrum in the, the diagram there in that red box. Even if there is movement or dispersal that we aren't detecting uh, with collars, um, we still can't be sure that they're successfully breeding because demographic movement does not necessarily imply genetic exchange. We need uh, animals to not only successfully migrate over, but then also successfully breed. Um, fortunately, we can leverage our genetic data uh, to take a look at relatedness among individuals and determine if gene flow is occurring across the landscape. Um, so we took those fecal, sample, those fecal samples that, uh, that I just discussed, um, we added tissue samples from captured and collared elk, uh, as well as hunter harvest tissues to increase our sample size. And so we had uh, 490 distinct individual elk um, to evaluate population structure. And so we split them up uh, by females and males to look for differences um, in dispersal by sex. Uh, and then we run it through a program um, to determine how best to describe these data in terms of genetic clusters. So, so uh, this program suggested that four genetic clusters is the best way to describe the system, uh, but not quite how we intuitively would have divided it into four. Um, so here's what that system looks like 
described as for genetic clusters. So we have our sampling locations uh, color coded according to genetic assignment into one of four distinct cl clusters. Um, and then the colored circles indicate an individual with over 80% of their ancestry estimated from a single genetic cluster. And then the open circles are admixed individuals. So this means that their ancestry did not assign to any single group over 80%. So at this level, we clearly see a spatial pattern to these genetic clusters. We have the East Park and the Northeast. Uh, and then interestingly, the Cache Creek uh, group splits into two subgroups, what we're, we're calling uh, the Cache Creek Rock Quarry group in the West uh, and the Cache Creek Cortina Ridge group in the East. And then Potter Valley and Pillsbury are, are, are lumped together as one cluster. But we see a lot of admixture, a lot of admix individuals in that area. So we want to see if we can take a look uh, at a, a finer scale and see if we detect um, further informative substructure elsewhere. And indeed, when we describe the system as six genetic clusters, uh, we see Potter Valley uh, has been separated from Pillsbury long enough to emerge as um, genetically distinct. Uh, all other groups remain the same. We do see this further subdivision uh, within Cache Creek, but there's not really a clear spatial pattern. So uh, we consider five genetic population clusters to be the most informative way to describe this system uh, as labeled on the map. And so <clears throat> we also looked at gene flow across these five clusters. Uh, so here we've got a schematic representing those genetic clusters. Uh, and in terms of gene flow, we specifically looked at migrants per generation. Migrants per generation are the estimated number of individuals successfully breeding from one population into another. And so generally speaking, one or more uh, migrants per, per generation uh, can effectively counter genetic drift. Uh, and, and act to maintain genetic variation. So when we look at, at uh, females in this system, uh, we detected meaningful migrants per generation uh, only within the Cache Creek population unit. Um, so bi-directional, more or less symmetric exchange of migrants across those two Cache Creek subgroups. Uh, all other female population units uh, appear to be isolated. That, that's not too surprising. Um, because biologically, we'd expect males to disperse more readily uh, than females. Um, when we look at males, uh, we first see a, a relatively large number of migrants per generation from Pillsbury into Potter Valley. Uh, that tracks with that demographic history of that mass exodus in the late 70s. <clears throat> uh, and then we also have gene flow in one direction from uh, Cache Creek, Cortina Ridge into Cache Creek Rock Quarry. Now, it's important to note that uh, gene flow for one sex is beneficial uh, for both sexes, the population as a whole. Uh, so when we look at uh, both sexes, um, it looks like there's, there's two primary uh, potential barriers on the landscape uh, precluding regular exchange across the greater system uh, represented by those dashed lines here. And, uh, you know, these results really open the door for future research to, to better understand um, conditions on the landscape uh, or demographic or behavioral factors that might act as barriers, uh, as well as those features that uh, serve to promote movement in this system. Um, but what's evident here is that Lake Pillsbury uh, and East Park are both potentially isolated in the sense that neither receives any migrants from, for either sex. Um, so they may be the most at risk populations, uh, genetically speaking. Um, if anything, continued genetic monitoring uh, is certainly warranted here and doing so over time, uh, we can evaluate if any of these populations are candidate herds that may benefit uh, from translocated elk. Uh, so translocations are still periodically conducted today uh, when confined herds reach carrying capacity within the high fence, uh, CDFW partners with state and federal agencies uh, to conduct aerial captures to relocate these surplus animals. Uh, so we uh, capture the animals in the pens and bring them into a processing camp where uh, they're examined by veterinarians and biologists uh, to ensure elk health and safety. Uh, they're then brought into a loading corral where we unhobble the animal and we load it into a squeeze chute. 
and on a trailer and then they're transported to their new home uh, and released. And so this is beneficial in a few ways. Uh, first, it alleviates pressure uh, on resources in the high fence area. And, and second, it potentially injects new genetic material into, into the free ranging herds. Uh, the most recent translocation I believe took place uh, in February, 2019. Uh, we captured animals from uh, San Luis National Wildlife Refuge and the Tupman State Tule Elk Reserve uh, and released them in a few uh, different free ranging herds. Um, here we have some cows being released to join up uh, with an existing herd at uh, Carrizo Plain in Southern California. Uh, so in the future, uh, there's opportunity to use some of these genetic tools that I just described uh, to guide selection of source herds and recipient herds and, and even what individuals to move based off genetic data. And, and uh, doing so, we can work to maximize uh, the realized genetic benefits of translocations. And um, actually one of my lab mates, uh, Taylor Davis, is conducting a statewide genetic analysis of elk in California uh, to include all, all three subspecies across the state. So she's doing genetic work at a, a much greater scale than what I did and her results are going to be really valuable and really informative. Uh, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing the results that she produces. <clears throat> uh, so in review, uh, in the Tule elk, we have a, a unique subspecies of North American elk uh, only found in California. Uh, they're uniquely adapted uh, to California's Mediterranean climate conditions. Um, as recently as the 19th century, uh, Tule elk numbers declined in this uh, dynamic and complicated relationship uh, concurrent with European settlement where they nearly became extinct, but they're able to rebound uh, due to dedication and cooperation between both public and private entities. <clears throat> uh, and today we continue to apply a variety of tools uh, to monitor and maintain viable tule elk populations and uh, really to carry on the, the conservation efforts of tule elk that was first initiated by Henry Miller uh, with the ultimate goal to manage and, and use California's elk resources wisely and for, for all to enjoy. <clears throat> uh, so briefly, I'd just like to take a moment to uh, acknowledge the folks who have helped make this uh, research possible. Um, particularly my mentors, Dr. Ben Sachs uh, and, and Josh Bush, uh, among many others who have helped out. And of course, our, our funding sources, uh, the Department, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Um, and then of course, uh, thank you, Bill and Tuli Omi for inviting me to speak. Uh, it, was, it was a great pleasure to be here and share this information with everybody tonight. Um, and so with that, I can open up to any questions that you might have. All right, thank you very much, Tom. It's great to have you. And there are a number of questions in the chat. Um, do you want to go into the chat yourself or do you want me to read them? I'll have a look. If you want to pick some out that you think might be good. Well, the first question was asking if you have a recording of a bugle. Of a <laughs> um, I'm sure I do somewhere that I'd have to dig up. Uh, right. yeah, yeah, I'm sure it wouldn't be too hard to find one. It's, it's a pretty quick uh, Google search or YouTube search, I think. Yeah. Well, I'll, since I've got you, I'm going to ask you a quick question myself. All right. Uh, I know up on the north, north coast there are Roosevelt elk. Are there any places where the Roosevelt elk might actually interact with the Tule elk? That's a good question. And actually, um, the short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is that um, so there's some elk herds northwest of Tule elk herds northwest of the ones that I um, focused my study on uh, further into Mendocino County. And uh, those, the range of those herds potentially overlap with some of the southern uh, range boundary of the Roosevelt elk. And last year in March, I helped out with the Mendocino aerial surveys and we actually detected, we, we saw a Roosevelt cow in a Tule elk group up uh, north of Laytonville. Um, so it's pretty interesting to see. So there's definitely potential for them to interact. There's potential for them to hybridize. And so that 
poses more genetic questions um, that warrant future studies. It looks like Josh uh, has been very involved in the chat, answering a lot of questions. So thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. Yeah, you, you should introduce Josh just a bit. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I mentioned Josh a time or two in the talk. Uh, he is the regional biologist with CDFW for uh, Calusa Lake and, and Yolo County. Um, so uh, he's very knowledgeable. He knows his stuff. Uh, he's your local biologist that if, if you live in the area uh, of Tuliomi and, and Clusa Lake counties, he's, he's your go-to guy um, for anything, anything wildlife. So there are a couple of questions about uh, the Point Reyes population. Mm -hmm. So what's the current status there? Uh, the question specifically was, what's the current status regarding fewer cattle ranches so there are more land, there's more land for Tule Elk? Sure. I mean, the point raised situation, it's a really complex situation that, you know, honestly, I'm not involved in. I, I, I'm just kind of vaguely aware of it. And um, that population, it, it, it's, a con it's confined behind high fence. Uh, they've tested positive for uh, a contagious disease. So they're not a candidate population to uh, relocate those individuals. Uh, as surplus animals in, in translocations for genetic augmentation. Um, that was a so, good question, actually. So there's there's not an easy solution when they when that population reaches carrying capacity, and I think that's kind of where the controversy is, um, and our our uh, state elk and pronghorn coordinator uh, Kristen Denrider has her hands full um, trying to solve that. I mean it's. It's going to take a lot of cooperation from a lot of agencies and, and uh, private entities as well to come up with some kind of tenable solution. I mean, there's no, I can't just come up with an answer right now that everyone would agree with, I, you know, no matter what I said, it's um, going to take a lot of effort from a lot of people. Uh, you mentioned the Laytonville herd. Is that considered to be part of the Potter Valley herd or is that separate? No, so that's... That's separate, it's quite a ways north and, and in the Mendocino County, uh, you know, it, it is similar where you have these kind of discrete uh, population units um, because historically they didn't really occupy this coniferous uh, forested areas. And we still see that today, like the Lake Pillsbury population, they primarily are just in this uh, kind of open mountain glade, this flat open plain, which is suitable habitat for them. And, um, the discrete kind of uh, herd units in Mendocino are, are the same. They really occupy those open uh, pastures in, in the forest and tend not to use the, um, the thickly forested, uh, coniferous forested areas as much. Here's a question. Uh, do bull elk ever get their antlers <laughs> stuck in a collared bull's collar? while sparring during rut? That's a good question. And um, our collars on the bulls, they have this uh, expansion piece that allows the, the collar to expand because the bull's neck will swell when they're in the rut uh, because of hormones. And um, so this expansion piece, it's been ripped off a number of times where we've, done the, we've had to go collect the collar um, on the ground where we get a mortality signal and we just found the collar because it was ripped off. and. Uh, presumably by uh, bulls sparring is what it would look like. So um, they don't get stuck, they just rip right through them. Okay, there's a question about wasting disease. Josh answered that uh, it's not in California, but maybe you could say something. Is that a, a Rocky Mountain problem? <clears throat> uh, yeah, so chronic wasting disease, it's a, uh, it's a disease um, that deer and elk can get where they, it's linked with proteins in the brain and uh, causes all sorts of issues. And it's very contagious and, and very hard to stop the spread of. It has not been detected in um, California to date. Uh, the department, we uh, are vigilant in monitoring CWD. We test uh, deer and elk regularly uh, year round for CWD. Um, we, we're even to the point where in any roadkill deer or elk, we sample their lymph nodes and send them to our lab in uh, Rancho Cordova. Um, so we're, we're very vigilant about it and preventing 
CWD from spreading into California. Um, and we even have regulations, laws and regulations uh, to help fight that potential spread um, by preventing if you hunt out of state, uh, you're, you're not allowed to bring um, the head or, or, or spying of deer or elk into the state. And that the, the sole idea is to prevent potential CWD spread. <clears throat> it's a question uh, from Helen about the uh, ecological role of tule oak. Uh, how did, what's, what ecological role did tule oak play historically? For example, how did they affect plant communities? And uh, the question about their main predators, what was their main predators? So that's a good question. I mean, they're, so like I said, they're, they're a large herbivore grazer. So they prefer um, kind of more uh, early cereal stages. So uh, that kind of new vegetative growth and they act to kind of keep landscapes more open. Um, we start to see less elk use in areas when, um, when there's fire suppression and uh, chaparral and chemise stands can grow to these senescent stages where they're just very mature, thick stands that elk just can't move through. Um, and in, in, in terms of how, what effects it had on the plant community, I mean, that's a good question that, you know, a lot of our diet studies, um, if you could even really call them that, they're just, they're old observation studies about like what some biologists saw elk eating on one day and then they went and looked at the patch that they were feeding on. And that's from like the 70s. That's the best that I could find. Um, so it's really tough to say the specific impacts that they would have on plant communities uh, without you know, actually conducting formal uh, research in my opinion. Um, so hopefully there's opportunity to do that uh, someday. Um, and then in, uh, what was the other question in terms of- Well, predation? Josh actually answered that one. He said the main predators were grizzly bears, which I find really interesting. Historically, yeah. Yeah, yeah so actually grizzly bears uh, were a, a more of a plains animal um, and they were found more regularly in the Central Valley than anywhere else in California um, and uh, in the United States in general. So that's actually something that's kind of a misnomer. But yeah, grizzly bears were probably the main uh, predator of Tule Oak historically. I, I know that Bear Valley just in Bear Creek uh, up around Highway 16 and Highway 20 where that Cache Creek population is was, was named after grizzly bears, not black bears. <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. And I know there are quite on, on uh, Pewter Creek down towards Davis there. Uh, I remember seeing in our mammalogy lab, there's a lot of uh, quotes and stuff about grizzly bears. There's uh, quite a density of grizzly bears along Pewter Creek back in the day that uh, people used to run in with quite a bit. So that's interesting. Now here's a question from William. Um, what would be your opinion regarding advisability of introducing tule elk into Southern Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument? How would they fare with limited predators? Now the, the Cache Creek population is in the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument. So I'm not I, sure if he's talking about going further south from that. I'm assuming that maybe they're wandering around Lake Berryessa specifically. Um, so the thing about translocations today they're mainly used to augment existing herds. Uh, establishing new herds it requires a lot of research and a lot of environmental documents and formal planning and, and things like that in order to get permits and, and permission uh, to release elk into new areas. And um, in my opinion, it's better for us to focus our efforts um, on augmenting existing herds and uh, looking into how elk use the landscape and <coughs> manipulating and, and conserving and uh, doing habitat restoration activities uh, to encourage natural elk expansion. And I think that if we did that more and applied that more on the ground um, and did some conservation work like, like Tuliomi does, uh, that could lead to elk naturally expanding from Cache Creek and reaching uh, Lake Berryessa. A question from Nancy. Can you talk about the effect of last year's wildfires on the elk? Sure. Um, we have some collar data uh, before the fires. Well, I'm assuming 
what year are we in now? We're, I'm, I'm thinking of the 2018 kind of large wildfires. Um, yeah, and, and last, last fall, obviously a repeat of that. Or, yeah. yeah, and, and so uh, generally elk's response to fire, um, they usually just use the, the burn scar, the area that burned through because it invigorates new growth. Um, now these larger fires that California starts to deal with nowadays, um, the intensity of it can you know, destroy habitat for any wildlife, but generally wildfire is good for wildlife um, and invigorates growth. And then we, we do see some of our collared bulls in that uh, Lake Pillsbury area uh, use the area from that ranch fire that was burned a few years back. They're, they're in that area right now um, using it pretty extensively. And that's different than uh, pre-fire. Pre and I'll just share with everybody what I was talking to Tom about <laughs> before is that um, the, the Silver Spur property that it's owned by Tuliomi up, up by um, Indian Valley Reservoir, that burned in the 2018 fire or 2019 or just burned fairly recently. And um, so we've been watching that recover and we have seen Tule elk scat. We haven't actually picked up any elk on our game cameras, but they're there, they're up there. Uh, next question from Laura, uh, how long can elk go without drinking fresh water? That's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure of a specific time frame, but we do know from research elsewhere uh, in California that tule elk are fairly water dependent. Um, so I would imagine that they can't go extraordinarily long without it because uh, in, the, in the summer months when water dries up, they're really limited in, in range. Um, they don't travel too far from, from standing water or, or stock ponds. I'm sorry, I can't give you a specific time frame, but I think, I think that answers it. Okay. <laughs> uh, from Paul, is there an organization or a program that is driving the establishment of new subpopulations within the meta population? Um, no, so so like I said, our, the the focus now is is augmenting existing populations. Um, back like twenty years ago, uh, the state and the federal government had to produce a, a semi annual report on um, tule elk populations, and one of the last ones that they uh, produced, they they essentially said that anywhere that tule elk could potentially be reintroduced. They've already been reintroduced because of um, mainly because of land conflict now. I mean, there anywhere else that's suitable for them within historic range uh, is agricultural land, and a lot of ranchers aren't really keen on having a bunch of elk thrown on their property and potentially competing with um, with their livestock. And and that's a warranted concern of, of private landowners. Um, so really the best thing that, that we can do. Uh, we, have, we have plenty of tule elk at this point and it's, uh, I think that the best move forward is focusing on the populations that we do have and how we can um, naturally link those populations so that we can facilitate uh, natural movement between them and then we don't have to rely on human mediated translocations. Okay, a question from Jackie. Um, <laughs> she saw a small herd of elk at Bodega Head, and I guess I don't know exactly where Bodega Head is, but uh, she asked if they were Roosevelt elk or Tule elk. I think that's, I think Bodega is like north of Point, Point Reyes, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, that would likely be Tule elk. Roosevelt elk don't get um, that far down south into California. So they would be part of that uh, point raised population. Yeah, I think they'd be part of the, the free roaming point raised population that's on the other side of the peninsula there. Okay. I didn't know they were on the other side of the peninsula. There are, some of them actually swam across. And so there's like a, there's a small band on the other side. And that's where you see more of that controversy where people, you see like signs for elk fences now uh, and things like that. Um, and that's, yeah, it's because of the, the small number of free ranging animals over there. And then another question about Humboldt County. So that would be the Roosevelt elk, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are there good viewing areas in Lake County? 
in Lake County. Or, or yeah, somewhere nearby. Dri drive right up to Lake Pillsbury. There's campgrounds that you can go camp at. And I mean, I every time I've stayed up there, the elk are right in that basin. I mean, you cannot miss them. They are in your face the whole time that you're out at Lake Pillsbury. So if you ever want to see Tule elk and get some really good photos, Lake Pillsbury is probably the number one place to go. It's a beautiful area, um, especially in like September, October, the bulls are, are uh, bugling and sparring right on that, on the lake edge and you can watch them from a camp chair. So it's really cool. And I've also seen them right around that Highway 16, Highway 20 mm -hmm. uh, area along uh, Cash Creek and Bear Creek. Yeah, there's like a there's like a little viewing kiosk too, right at that junction with some uh, kind of some background info on, on Tule Elk. And that's a good spot too uh, to see bulls and cows kind of coming off that, uh, some of those hills there. Let's see, now Josh has answered a number of, number of these. Um, Let's see, uh, is there <laughs> conflict between cattle and tule elk on the same range? And is there a problem with cattlemen complaining about elk? So yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, it depends on the area. Some areas like in uh, Del Norte County and Humboldt up there, they have a really big problem with Roosevelt herds um, grazing on land that are utilized by cattle. Um, down in our study area, we don't really seem to have that much of a problem. Elk seem to uh, tend to disassociate with cattle down here for whatever reason. The cattle really outcompete them on those valley floors, and the elk tend to use uh, the upper uh, elevational hills a bit more. Um, and you, you also have, you know, in different areas, different times uh, when when ranchers are putting cows on and pulling cows. Um, so. Overall, I, the cattle generally outcompete tule elk and they tend to disassociate with them, um, but it's location uh, specific. So I just have another question for myself. Um, so the, <laughs> currently there are no grizzly bears around. So are there any predators for tule elk at the moment? Yeah. So. Uh, We've had some of our collared cows and bulls that have been taken by mountain lions. Um, it's, it's not very common, but it does happen. Um, and this is kind of another gray area where, you know, really I'm just taking a, a best guess because we don't have data to describe. We don't have good hard data to describe uh, predation rates um, onto the elk. And uh, they're probably most vulnerable right after birth and, and between that first year of life. and um, like with with deer uh, or any other ungulate during that time frame, um, it's likely that bears probably take calves. Uh, coyotes could even take calves, and, and mountain lions definitely have an impact on them too. But uh, that really is just speculation at this point. You know, I would definitely um, want to see some kind of predation study in the future to really answer that question. Okay, great. Well, I think we've answered the questions. All right. And Josh is. Yeah, Josh is just taking question. control. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, oh, here's here's a good. I'll answer this this one real quick. This last one. So, um, okay. Woody Elliott asked if inbreeding depression is is evident in tule elk herds. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, we don't really see evidence of inbreeding depression, meaning um, like malformations and things like that. Uh, and the kind of thought process behind it is that during the, um, the rapid decline of tule elk, any uh, maladaptive genes were purged from the gene pool. And so just by happy chance, the two to three elk that remained were like representatives of the fittest tule elk that they could be. And so that really is probably why um, tule elk are so resilient, uh, starting these new populations everywhere. Um, there's been a couple instances at uh, Point Reyes and another population where they've had um, like a cleft palate, which is uh, just kind of like 
the upper lip is kind of malformed and that's uh, evidence of inbreeding, but that's been about the extent of it. And it's, it's even questionable if that was due, due to genetics because they've also uh, have been shown to be deficient in nutrients in a couple of these herds that have had that, including like copper deficiencies and things like that. Um, so overall, given the, the decline to two or three animals and the low genetic diversity, they remarkably are, are fairly fit animals. And that's a really good thing um, for, for the survival of tule elk into the future. So they've got, they've really got uh, a good thing going for them in that, in that sense. Okay, great. Anybody else have any questions? Last chance. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for, for joining me tonight. I appreciate your time. Um, it was great to, to share this with everybody. And uh, again, thank you, Bill. I appreciate you inviting me and, and hosting me. And Josh, thanks for uh, knocking some of those questions out of the park in there. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. All right. See you. See, everybody come back next month for the next talk. All righty. Bye. Thanks, y'all. Oh, and I'll just say one more thing. This is, this talk has been recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'll be sending out a note to everybody that registered with the link and um, it, it will be public. So you can watch it again, many times as you want. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, right. Bill, appreciate it. Okay, bye.